Joining me now to discuss the latest is former British Army Colonel and chemical weapons expert Hamish de Bretton Gordon. Good morning to you, Hamish. Good morning, Thanks to you. Thanks for joining us. Um, now, I mean, th this is the accusation. The body has not been released. We don't have any uh, knowledge sure, uh, of how this man has died. Information is put out by the Putin government, by the Kremlin, very quickly, and some would say very suspiciously. Um, it's been made clear by governments around the world, including our own government, that this, no doubt at all, that this man was murdered as a political opponent of uh, Vladimir Putin. But what evidence do we have that it was a, a second attempt to kill him, or this time a successful attempt, with Novichok? Well, um, you make a very good point there. Um, it's all about evidence. Certainly when we saw Navalny last Thursday, he didn't look like somebody who was about to die. The Russians claim that he died of sudden cardiac death syndrome. It's a syndrome that I have, so I know quite a lot about it, and he certainly didn't look as though he had it. I don't think there's any um, discussion of the fact that, uh, sadly, Navalny is now dead and uh, very clearly points to, to the Russians. With, with Putin's sham election coming up on the 12th of March, really it is Navalny who is the key opposition leader the only one who, who who could possibly face off Putin. Let's face it, he's got rid of all the rest of his opposition. You know, some using deadly chemicals like Novichok or or, or other type things. So um, it is only Putin who, who gains advantage by killing Navalny. Now, Novichok, as uh, Yulia Navalny is suggesting, uh, would, would seem a plausible type of weapon to use. We know Novichok was designed by the Russians to be undetectable by our detectors. And, and as you said, it would appear that the body is not going to be released to the family for 14 days. So the chance of a rural uh, a hospital being able to do a post-mortem to find out what killed Navalny in 14 days time is pretty unlikely. Yeah. And, and also, of course, you know, it would be only a, a laboratory like Portland Down that would be able to work it out. So. Um, it's pretty clear. I think the main thing people need to get out of this is that Putin has no limits. No, and uh, when considering what we're going to do to support Ukraine and stop Putin going further west from Ukraine, we need to consider that. He yeah. will do anything to realise his aims as a, you know, restoring the old Soviet Union and a greater Russia. I mean, his, uh, and Alexei Navalny's widow, widow Yulia Navalny, she has vowed to carry on the fight again. Uh, you know, she is not on Russian territory. We, we spoke to um, Bill Browder yesterday, another you know big enemy of Vladimir Putin, and who who has known Navalny for you know twenty odd years, and said you know he didn't think he was going back as a martyr. He genuinely thought that there was you know Putin was going to fall, and and that there would be a chance of a of a, new, a regime change in Moscow. Um, clearly, you know he's you know the latest opposition leader to be killed. We know anyone who stood up to Vladimir Putin is either dead or has faced repeated attempts to kill. What I'm fascinated by with uh, Putin is what, why use a nerve agent? Why not, why not, why, 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 did, why did Navalny even last that long in prison? Why was he not just, you know, just shot, strangled, what, beat, not beaten to death in this first few days? Why does Putin go through the motions of pretending it's a natural death? Well, I think um, one's got to understand Putin's background. He is a spy by background. And uh, the Russian uh, spy network, the FSB and the GRU and others, um, they, they assassinate people pretty regularly. Anybody who doesn't sort of share their views and shows any opposition. And they, they like to use things like Novichok, polonium-210, ricin, a, a toxic um, chemical, to actually get rid of these people. So I think one, one needs to understand that. You know, what, why, why did Putin not get rid of Navalny sooner? Well, again, I think it's all about timing. Um, mm. He wanted to make a big statement ahead of his, his sham election on, on the 12th of March, which is coming up. And, you know, that, that is the way he pells it. And, of course, you know, it is only a few people close to Putin who really have any influence on what happens in Russia. You know, 99% of... Of, of Russians, uh, you know, are starving and downtrodden, and it's their young uh, sons that are dying on the battlefields of the Donbass. So it's only Putin needs to keep his oligarchs close to him because they're the only ones who influence them. Anybody really wants to understand how the Russians work, there's a brilliant film a few years ago called The Death of Stalin, uh, and that really explains how, how the Russian hierarchy works and 
you know, is the only way that Putin will be deposed, I expect, by by one of those sharks surrounding him. But at the moment, he he has the whip hand yep. and he is keeping the coffers of his oligarchs full. And as he seems to be still making progress in Ukraine, he will keep going. The only way to stop him is to ensure the Ukrainians can stop him in Ukraine and push him back. That's how he will fall. No other way, I expect. Yeah. And that's why it's so important. We must keep Ukraine's... Uh, stocked up with ammunition and other things so that they can prevail. Absolutely. And, and again, the focus has moved away from Ukraine with the with focus on what's been happening in Gaza. We do try to still cover what's happening in Ukraine. And again, we're facing on the 24th of February uh, this weekend, the, the, the second anniversary uh, of their invasion by Russia. And again, you know, just seeing this stalemate over the winter uh, and, and, you know, no, no real signs of, of enough weaponry, enough, uh, enough funds going to... Uh, the uh, the Ukrainians, although there is now a lot of talk about basically taking all that central bank funding, hundreds of billions of dollars worth sitting there from the Russian central bank and handing that over to Ukrainians for their war effort and their rebuilding effort. Do you think that's likely to happen? Well, I hope it is. But but actually, you know, it, it's not dollar bills and pound notes that, that, that is going to stop Putin to today and tomorrow. Work. It might well stop him in a few weeks' time. You know, what, what they need is hardware. And, and as you say, the, there are lots of desperate things happening in the world, not least in Gaza, Gaza and the Middle East and what Iran's up to. But, but what we in this country must focus on is what's happening in Europe. Because, um, you know, we, if we don't get this right and provide the hardware, you know, we could be fighting Putin as early as next year, you know, in the fields of Europe, which is absolutely the last thing we need. So, yeah, give all those funds that are, being squirrelled away all over the place from his ill-gotten gains, absolutely. But let's follow Denmark and give them every, give the Ukrainians every bit of ammunition they need. I mean, apparently they were withdrawn from a Deepka last week. So they ran out of ammunition. That is just criminal in the support that we should be giving. So, yeah, we have got to make sure we hold Putin now. Otherwise, I really fear that me and my like will be in our tanks next year in Europe fighting the Russians. And you say in Europe, where? Are we talking about the Baltics? They're, they're, we know the Baltic states are very fearful. Poland, I mean, all the Eastern European states, they take this far more seriously than the Western states, where we're kind of a bit, well, you know, post-Cold War, it's nothing to do with us, we're fine. They've lived under you know, Soviet control far more recently. They get it. They do, absolutely. And they, they, you know, as the Russian economy is completely focused on this war effort, uh, some of those Baltic states are doing it as well. But I think people need to understand, you know, the first Russian boot that goes west outside Ukraine into a NATO country triggers what we call Article 5, and we will all be involved. Uh, and absolutely, the Baltic states might be able to hold the Russians a bit, but it is crucial that, um, you know, ourselves, the French and the Germans, uh, really need to get stuck in yeah. to make sure it happens. And, of course, the key thing is that Putin still doesn't think we're up for this, which is why he keeps going and why he invaded no, Ukraine in the first no, it's place. No, it's not he doesn't yeah. think. He knows. That's my worry. I, I would not trust that most uh, NATO nations would actually step up. I want to just get you briefly, though, on what you mentioned, Gaza, as well. Um, we've got the, the this threat from the Israeli government to, uh, to, to the Hamas in Gaza that they will basically they don't get their, all their hostages back. We think another 130 still uh, being held in Gaza, that they will, uh, in the next three weeks, they will launch a an assault on Rafah. We know there are a million evacuated civilians uh, in, in the, the Rafah area, people being bombed in refugee camps, look, as much as one can support. And I, you, I am steadfast behind Israel and their right to self-defence and their, their right to try and route, route out uh, Hamas wherever they are. Um, however, the concern for civilians at this point is, is really overriding. There is now a lot of move by the US to try and stop that invasion uh, of Rafah happening. But at the same time... Um, we got the undermining of Israel again and again. You know, SNP motion in the Commons tomorrow. Lots of Labour backbenchers may well defy Keir Starmer and support it, calling for an immediate ceasefire. And we know what an immediate ceasefire means. It means allowing Hamas to stay in control in Gaza. Where do you stand on all of this? Well, I, I stand, I'm sure, like everybody in the world. You know, we want, we want to see peace in Gaza. We want to see peace in the Middle East. We don't want a single person killed. But the reality is not quite like that. I'm sure a lot of people watched the programme on the BBC last night about the funding of Hamas and the billions and billions of dollars the hierarchy of Hamas have, which is stashed away in places like Doha and elsewhere. 
so that their leadership are living the life of Riley. It is those poor people that you're seeing now on your screens in the refugee camps who suffer. Now, if Hamas have any morals at all, they will give up those hostages. And once those hostages are given up, the extra 100, I think it is, for Israel, then the negotiations can start and peace can start and we can get, you know, the Israelis and everybody else can get food to those desperately poor people. So it's, it's very much in Hamas's hands. They've got, yeah. they've got three weeks. They either decide to sacrifice you know, all those kids and babies that we're seeing on the screen at the moment, or they give the hostages back and then there is a negotiation, a peace settlement. Um, and that, that is as stark as it is. We know that the Israelis you know, are not going to stop until those hostages are, are secured, uh, and they shouldn't. So it's, it's very much in Hamas's hands. They've got three weeks. And um, you know, I'm sure that the leadership who are making all these decisions, living in great luxury in the Middle East, um, you know, may well want to throw their fighters, continue into the fight. But it is just lunacy. So. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with, absolutely with peace, but once those hostages are secured. Uh, hey, Mr. Bretton Gordon, really appreciate your thoughts on all of those big stories. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, let's go back to Tom Slater, who is um, in the studio. Um, we've got this, this vote tomorrow, this motion tabled by the SNP mm -hmm. uh, on Gaza and, this, and the immediate ceasefire. There has been, the thing, as it always is, I think, on the left, SNP and Labour backbenchers, this idea that, well, you know, I'm a, I, again, what is, the, what is the term I'm using? I'm, I'm now a genocidal Zio hack. That's a, quite a typical thing I'm called on social media now for backing Israel's right to self-defence. Not, not, I'm not supportive of children, innocent children dying. It's horrible, it's awful. I don't want a single one to die. But... It's Hamas that's putting them, in my view, in, in, in harm's way, uh, not, not to Israel. Um, but, but there's this idea that people on the left, yes, I mean, that they are, they're virtuous, that they're good people because they want a ceasefire. But a ceasefire on what terms? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, this is such an obvious question as to when it, you're talking about any conflict. It's like, of course, everyone wants the fighting to stop. Of course, everyone wants peace. Of course, no one wants to see civilian casualties, which are unfortunately inevitable in a war, particularly when you've got an adversary that's willing to put civilians directly in harm's way. But at the same time, you think, on what terms, under at what points in the yeah. particular We'd have loved conflict? a ceasefire in 1940. No, exactly. I mean, on what terms? It's precisely. <laughs> and it's just this, it's the reason that I think it's um, worth properly paying attention to what these people are arguing is these are often people who wanted Israel to give up from the very beginning, who yeah. didn't really think that they had a right to defend themselves. Who or thought really cheering they be on October anyway. the 7th. Precisely. Before any, they were cheering for days and days before a single, you know, act of uh, of self defence happened from from the Israeli the, forces. Those demonstrations began literally weeks before the yeah. war properly which tells actually you commenced, which tells you everything. Absolutely. Absolutely.